Welcome everyone. Oh. Welcome everyone to the Center on Finance Law and Policy's November Blue Bag Lunch Talk. I am thrilled today to welcome Professor Eduardo Montero from the Ford School of Public Policy. My name is Christy Baer, and I am the Assistant Executive Director of the Center on Finance Law and Policy. And uh, as usual, before I can let you have what you came for, I have to do a little promo for an upcoming event, which is the Center on Finance Law and Policy is in less than two weeks um, hosting our second Central Bank of the Future Conference. This year we'll be co-hosting with the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. If you are interested in financial inclusion, in monetary policy, in central bank digital currencies, then you definitely will want to stop in. The conference is free. Um, we have a impressive group of a few dozen speakers for this, including Mary Daly from the San Francisco Fed. Um, sorry, blanked for a second. Um, Assistant Governor um, Shea Seri from the Central Bank of Cambodia, um, futurist Dr. Claire Nelson, and, um, and former um, CFTC Chair uh, Timothy Massett. So it should be a good event and I hope that you will attend. Uh, I put the link in the chat so that you can see uh, how to register. Now, without further delay, um, I want to tell you a little bit about Eduardo Montero, who has agreed to present to us today. Um, he joined the faculty of the Ford School of Public Policy in 2018 as an assistant professor of public policy. He's originally from San Jose, Costa Rica, and he's an economist whose interests include development economics, political economy, economic history, and specifically, he studies how variation in institutions, such as property rights and cultural norms, like mistrust, affect development and development policy in Central America and Central Africa. That is a mouthful. He's gonna make it sound so much clearer than I just did, which is why he is the professor and I am not. At the Ford School, Professor Montero teaches microeconomics, applied methods for development, and a class that's called the Economics of Developing Countries. Today, he will be discussing one of his papers, Cooperative Property Rights and Development, Evidence from Land Reform in El Salvador. And you should have seen a link to that paper in the email that you received advertising this talk. So if you have not had a chance to download it and read it, I hope you will. But if you didn't, good news, he's right here and he is gonna tell you all about it. And so uh, without further delay, Professor Montero, thank you very much for being here today. No, oh, thank you so much for the invitation and for the really nice um, introduction. Um, I'm really excited to present this work to this audience um, just because it's so interdisciplinary. It's a topic that I think is quite important for Central America, but uh, there's not much work, but I think this audience will have a lot of interesting perspectives. So really looking forward to that. So this project is called Cooperative Property Rights and Development, Evidence from Land Reform in El Salvador. And I'm an economist and to a lot of economists, when they see this title, the, so they see cooperatives, they see land reform, the first thought that comes to their mind is an image like this, an image of Soviet collective farm propaganda and a really negative reaction. They're like, why are we studying this? We know these were a failure, like why are you wasting our time? But if you think about what the definition of a cooperative actually is, this is a firm where workers jointly own and manage production and they make decisions on a one member, one vote basis. So they make decisions democratically. We see many examples of cooperatives around the world today. So even just in the US, um, for example, law firms in the US are cooperatives where the partners own the firm and they share profits. So it's a very common type of um, ownership structure in the US, even though we don't think about it as cooperatives. Um, also in the US, in the Pacific Northwest, timber production has historically been done through these worker cooperatives as well. So there's examples of them in the US and across the world, there's a like many other examples we can think about. This is the famous kibbutz system in Israel and agricultural cooperatives in Latin America. These cooperatives are particularly prevalent in agriculture in Latin America because of land reforms that happened between 1920 and 1990 that really tried to create these cooperatives. So here's a map of Latin America 
and countries in dark blue are countries that experienced the land reform that actually created agricultural cooperatives managed by workers. As you can see, it affected about half of the countries, even though today we'll be focusing on the country in red, El Salvador. So just bit, taking a step back, these cooperatives are a very common form of organization. And there's been arguments about the pros and cons of this type of organization. So on the pro side, some people have argued that giving workers ownership stakes and decision-making rights may have beneficial incentive effects and also have beneficial equity effects. But there's been a lot of work arguing that this is actually bad for efficiency. This is because profit sharing may also lead to free riding problems. If we're all sharing profits, I could potentially slack off and get some of your profits. So while cooperatives might increase equity potentially, they decrease efficiency potentially. So there's been a lot of this theoretical work in economics in particular about how cooperative ownership may differ from outside ownership. So by outside ownership, I mean where there's an owner who contracts workers, but isn't working himself or herself for equity and efficiency. But there's very little causal empirical evidence. And by that, I, what, what I mean is that it's been very hard to study what are the cause, like what, how does um, being a cooperative affect equity and efficiency? The empirical challenge here is that property rights are not exogenously determined. Basically, they're not randomly determined. The type of ownership structure that's chosen in different places is affected by a number of other characteristics that we think might affect our outcomes of interest, such as efficiency and equity. So for example, cultural values, Latin America has a long history of cooperative ownership, but not so much perhaps in other places. Capital requirements might also affect um, whether a firm becomes a cooperative or not, but also things like equity and efficiency. This means that comparing all cooperatives to all non-cooperatives empirically won't provide causal evidence. They'll give you correlational evidence, but that's not causal because this comparison could capture the effects of these other differences on our outcomes of interest rather than ownership differences. So this meant we kind of lack this empirical evidence. Um, for outcomes such as, you know, how do ben workers benefit? What are the impacts for development? So what I tried to do in this paper is I asked this question. So what are the impacts of cooperative ownership relative to outside ownership for equity and efficiency? And to try to provide some empirical evidence on this, I examined the land reform program from El Salvador in 1980 and take advantage of a particular feature of the land reform, which was that all land belonging to individuals with cumulative land holdings over 500 hectares was reorganized into these agricultural cooperatives, but this didn't happen to properties below this threshold. So what I'll do is I'll use a regression discontinuity design, which just the intuition is very simple. I'll be comparing properties that are just above and just below this ownership threshold, where the properties above this threshold were reorganized into cooperatives managed by the former workers, but the properties right below that are probably quite similar remained uh, in the outside own system. So specifically for the case of El Salvador, these are also known as haciendas. And so I'll use this design to examine the impacts of cooperative ownership on outcomes such as the efficiency of production, specialization, so which crops they decide to produce, and equity, so how are worker incomes affected. And I think this contributes to three literatures, but I'm open to thinking about other literatures outside of this, especially like legal, for example, literatures. First, again, I think the main contribution here is providing some of these empirical evidence um, about equity and efficiency. What are the implications of cooperative ownership? We don't have a lot of literature on that. Second, I'll have a model in the paper that tries to think about the effects of this, um, these types of ownership structures in settings with incomplete contracts. What I mean by that, where it's, it's very hard to write very detailed contracts, and that's kind of the case in agriculture, and I'll talk about that later. And then more broadly, just thinking about the development of Latin America. So historically, there's been a lot of these land reforms, as I mentioned early, earlier, but we don't know what are their lasting consequences. It's also important for development policy today in Latin America. There's a lot of these cooperatives, um, and it's quite a contentious topic. So I think just providing any empirical evidence is hopefully a contribution that might inform policy, and I'll talk about that a bit more towards the end. So let me first um, start off by talking about El Salvador and the 1980 land reform. I'll then go into some of the data I collected, um, some of the empirical results, specifically for agriculture. Then I'll go into some focus group evidence to try to understand uh, the patterns I see in the data. And then I'll go over some of the results on incomes for workers.
So first on El Salvador, El Salvador is actually the most densely populated nation in Latin America. It's about the size of Massachusetts in terms of area and it has a population of about 6.5 million people. And historically it's had very extreme land inequality, even uh, compared to other Latin American countries. So for example, in 1971, just 1.5% of landowners held half of all the agricultural land in El Salvador. It's a pretty staggering amount. And El Salvador experienced a very brutal civil war from 1979 to 1992. It has a history of being run by military sponsored leaders. So since 1932 and a lot of elections with a lot of fraud where the military would um, basically commit a lot of fraud. In 1977, there was a fraudulent election, violence broke out, uh, and a coup was undertaken in 1979 by these a coup government that comprised both civilian and military. And so there was a lot of um, fighting until 1992. And land inequality was actually called the epicenter of this crisis for the start of the civil war. There was a large demand for access to land and people were upset about how, um, how much land the elites controlled in the country. So in response to some of this, on March 5th, 1980, the military junta government passed decree 153 on land reform. And this reform focused on the reorganization of these haciendas into cooperatives. And it was supposed to be carried out in two phases. So phase one called for the immediate reorganization of all land belonging to individuals with cumulative land holdings over 500 hectares. Phase two called for the reorganization of all land belonging to individuals with cumulative land holdings over 100 hectares. And it said a few years after phase one, but it didn't specify when that was supposed to happen. And in fact, phase two was never carried out actually due to organized opposition following phase one. Uh, so only phase one happened, phase two never happened. And why did the government decide to do this land reform? Officially, according to the law, the land reform had just three motives. The first was to try to diminish this land inequality that I talked about and try to increase agricultural productivity. They thought that the haciendas were unproductive and if workers got ownership rights, um, the agricultural sector would be more productive. Second, it was to try to increase incomes and reduce poverty in the rural areas of the country where poverty is, is very widespread. And third, it was to try to reduce the privileges for this economic elite that had basically ruled the country for uh, many years. Unofficially though, the land reform was also implemented to try to reduce conflict and keep people from joining the insurgency. Uh, so that was an important part of it as well, but that isn't in the official you know, law. And how was this land reform planned? So it was actually prepared under immense secrecy and executed at very full velocity. So it was prompted by the unexpected addition to the junta leadership on March 3rd of a pro land reform colonel, Colonel Mahana. And between March 3rd and March 6th, so really fast in the span of three days, basically the entire planning and execution of this land reform happened. So on March 4th, they called for this interagency coordination seminar, it was actually fake. Um, they gave everyone from the Ministry of Agriculture, who was important there, um, and from other institutes, these green key cards that barred them from leaving the hotel. So they were basically locked in there for two days and they were given national police escorts everywhere they went. There they drafted the law, they published it on March 5th and then the military gave them overnight transport to the haciendas uh, to notify these hacienda owners of the reform. And importantly, this 500 hectare threshold was just chosen to be a temporary threshold for implementation capacity reasons. They didn't feel like the military didn't feel like they had enough um, personnel to do phase one and phase two at the same time. So they decided to break it up and they just chose 500. And how was this executed? So phase one was carried out immediately after the reform was announced. So it was actually published on March 5th and then March 6th was when people were notified. The way this worked is that intervention teams made up of agronomists, um, technicians and military personnel were sent to notify the owners. These owners were compensated uh, with these 30 year bonds based on their tax declarations from 1975. So in theory, they did get compensated, but they were pretty upset about the compensation. It's, it's a pretty contentious issue because a lot of them had been, um, you know, claiming that their property wasn't very valuable to avoid taxes. And so they kind of got um, a bit upset when these, these bonds were tied to these tax returns. But they did get compensation 
And so by the end of 1986, ISTA had reorganized 369 haciendas into cooperatives. And this affected about 15% of El Salvador's land. Um, to give you a sense of the geographic scope, this is a map of El Salvador where I'm showing you the cantons of El Salvador, which is the lowest administrative unit of El Salvador. There's about 1400 cantons. And I'm coloring in light blue, the cantons that had at least one hacienda become a cooperative. And so as you can see here, the reform is pretty widespread across the country. It wasn't just concentrated in one area of the country. Um, it was pretty widespread. So the military went throughout the country to try to implement this, this law. Um, a lot of the properties, the biggest properties happen to be on the coast because that's where the most fertile land is. Um, but they did expropriate land in a lot of other places. So what is what are the aftermaths of these this, this land reform? So for landholders, um, obviously they weren't happy. It was called an economic, political, and social earthquake in the countryside. Landholders saw before their eyes something that they never imagined could possibly happen on lands that they had always governed absolutely. And it's coming from a person in the military who helped draft uh, the plan, but who was very tied with the elite. But what about for workers? So this is from focus group evidence that I did uh, in El Salvador, just talking to cooperative members who happened to be alive at the time of the reform, just to get their memories of that time. Uh, and I heard this like throughout this phrase, they would say to me on March 5th, we went to sleep as poor colonos or sharecroppers. And on March 6th, we woke up rich as landholders. To them, it was a shock, a complete shock, uh, it completely changed our lives. And in fact, since 2013, March 6th is known as the Land Reform Commemoration Day in El Salvador just for its importance uh, in the country's history. So let me tell you a little bit about the data I gathered and the empirical strategy I used. So I collected pre-land reform land holding data from the property registry of El Salvador it's from 1980, right before the reform was implemented. And this includes property size, location in the country at the canton level, and the name of the owner for every property over 100 hectares. So I wasn't able to find records for properties below that, only properties above 100 hectares. Then I gathered the land reform records, archival records from the Ministry of Agriculture, and then this ISTA, which is the Institute for Agrarian Transformation, which is created um, for these land reforms. And they continued the list of the properties that were reorganized into cooperatives with the name of the cooperative and the name of the old hacienda and the former owner for each of these haciendas uh, that was reorganized into cooperatives. So I'm able to match these two records. And that allows me to use this regression discontinuity design that I talked about earlier, where the intuition is super simple. I think it, economists can often do this. They like give fancy names to something that's very simple. I'll just be comparing properties just below and above the reform's ownership threshold. So these properties in 1980 were probably very similar, just one happened to be owned by an owner that had over 500 hectares, whereas the other one was owned by someone who had slightly below 500 hectares. Um, and so here's the, the empirical specification, but I won't go into the details too much. But two things that are pretty important to assumptions for this type of design are that first, owners weren't able to selectively sort. By that, they weren't able to sell off land and avoid the reform. If that was the case, then people right above the 500 hectare threshold could have avoided the reform, um, transferred land, et cetera. This was difficult to do for two reasons. One, there was a freeze on all land uh, transactions since 1977. But two, the land reform, like I said, happened very quickly. Um, so we can look at this empirically and see, is there evidence that there's less, there's fewer properties right above 500 hectares? We don't see that. So here I'm showing you the number of properties at each uh, owner land holding amount. And we don't see a discontinuity right at 500, suggesting that owners weren't able to selectively sort out to avoid the reform. If they did, we might be worried that these owners who sort are different than the ones that don't. Um, the second assumption is that properties that happen to become cooperatives are very similar to those right below the threshold that remained as haciendas. So we can look at this by looking at Differences in geography. These are things we think might matter for productivity, uh, worker incomes, etc. We can compare these things and we see that actually these properties right above and right below are quite similar, consistent with the way the reform was planned and this arbitrary threshold being chosen. So on things like land suitability, uh, precipitation, so rainfall, elevation, we see that these properties are very similar. We also can look at the suitability 
uh, geographic suitability for a number of different crops. So coffee suitability, sugarcane suitability, and cotton suitability. These are the three main cash crops uh, in El Salvador historically. Cotton is no longer produced very much in El Salvador, uh, but coffee and sugarcane are in there big part of the agricultural sector. We don't see differences in suitability there. And then we can look at staple crops. The two main ones in El Salvador are maize and beans, and we don't see differences there. So what this suggests is that these properties are quite similar. They were quite similar before the reform, except that some became cooperatives and some didn't. Another important thing here though, is because this reform is a bit uh, unique, is did they actually enforce this threshold? You can imagine they might not have done that, um, but we actually do see that they enforce this threshold pretty well. So not perfectly for sure. But what we see here is that holdings over 500 mostly became cooperatives. So what I'm showing you here is um, on the x-axis is the cumulative land holding of the owners. And then uh, the y-axis is whether or not the property became a cooperative. And as you can see, there's this discontinuity right at 500. So right as you pass 500 hectares in land holdings, you're more likely to have your property become a cooperative. So this is the variation I'm gonna exploit. It wasn't perfect. So some properties were able to somehow avoid expropriation for a number of reasons. Um, and I'm happy to talk more about that. But about, you can think about like 80% of the properties that should have become cooperatives became cooperatives. Okay, so let me go into some of the empirical results specifically for what cho crop choices are they making and their productivity in these crops. So I gathered data from the census of agriculture in El Salvador from 2007. This was the most recent census that they've done since 1971. They, just because of the war and a number of other reasons, they hadn't conducted census of agriculture. And it's conducted by the Ministry of Agriculture of El Salvador, MAG, and it's pretty detailed. It contains information on the types of crop produced, the area cultivated by crop, and then the amount produced for each crop. One shortcoming is that it doesn't have information on worker hours or worker incomes, which is something we do really care about. So I complement this data using household survey data from El Salvador. Um, the Encuesta de Hogares de Propósito Múltiple and many waves of it. This is a smaller sample size, so it's not a census, but it contains very detailed information on worker incomes, um, hourly wages and their consumption. So I'll use these two data sets to look at efficiency and equity. So the first result that I found is that these cooperative properties, so the ones right to the right um, of this threshold, devote less land to these cash crops, so coffee and sugarcane, but devote more land to staple crops, maize and beans. So here I'm showing you what are known as the regression discontinuity plots. And you can see there's a big discontinuity in the type of crop produced. When I look at the yields, so a measure of the productivity, so how much is produced per area unit of land, I find that cooperatives are less productive at these cash crops as well. So their sugarcane yields are lower and their coffee yields are lower, but they're more productive at staple crops actually. So their maize yields are much higher and their bean yields is plausibly higher. And so what does this tell us? Just to sum summarize what we found so far, this is relative to haciendas, these outside owned systems. Cooperatives owned by workers are more likely to specialize in staple crops over these cash crops. They devote more land to them and they're actually more productive with them compared to cash crops. Um, so I wanted to really understand what was going on here. It's an interesting pattern. And so I decided to go to El Salvador in 2017 and interview a lot of these cooperative workers and some hacienda workers to try to understand these patterns and see why are they choosing these crop choices. I think a lot of economists think that cash crops are which everyone should be producing because they're higher returns. But I want to understand from their perspective why they weren't doing that. So let me just talk about a little bit of that and the conceptual framework for the paper. So after interviewing a few cooperative members, they really highlighted that there's these stark differences between cash crops and staple crops in terms of um, contracting and sharing profits. So cash crops like coffee and sugarcane basically require centralized processing to be valuable. Otherwise they rot really quickly, they're not that valuable. So think about coffee or sugarcane, coffee beans themselves aren't really valuable. You need to process them, take off the pulp, dry them. 
uh, once they're dried, they have to be roasted. And once they're roasted, that's when they're valuable. This happens to, this, this only only happens in a centralized manner. Same as sugarcane. Sugarcane actually rots really quickly. Um, so you need to process it very quickly. What they told me this meant is that it's actually really easy for them to pay workers based on how much each worker produces. And it's very easy for them to keep track of in this cooperative, how much did each person contribute to the cash crop production and then decide to share profits based on that. So they share profits for cash crops. In contrast, for stable crops, these crops are quite different. They're not processed centrally and workers actually can consume their own production very easily. So if I produce maize, I could just, instead of you know, bringing it to the central cooperative center, I can just consume it myself. Um, what the, they told me this means is that it's, it ends up being quite difficult to pay workers based on how much they produce. And it's very hard to share profits here. So imagine we're sharing profits for our maize production. Well, I could just consume some of my maize production and still get the benefits of other people's maize profits. So that means that cooperatives are like, it's not really worth it to us to try to share profits for staple crops just because of these differences. And this is something that I, they told me a lot about it, and it's quite, quite interesting um, to hear them talk about it. So just to summarize what I found here is that cooperatives really do share profits for cash crops, but not so much for staple crops. And this partially drives some of their decisions that they're making. Um, I also learned that cooperatives have to agree to this cooperative constitution, which I think is super interesting too, um, from an economics perspective. So I think there's four things. So first is democratic decision-making is, is a rule. Most decisions have to be made by a one member, one vote basis. Things like how much land to devote to different crops, that's often democratic. But in a lot of these decisions and how much to pay workers, how much profits to share, that's democratic. And most of these things require just a majority, a simple majority. But there are a number of things that require a super majority. So selling land requires a super majority. So say I'm a cooperative member and I wanna sell some of the land. Um, it's really hard to do that. I need to get 67% of people to agree. And then there has to be a public government managed auction. This is partly done actually so that the former owners didn't go back and buy the land. So that's why the government manages these auctions so that they make sure the land isn't going back to the former owners. Um, joining a cooperative is actually pretty hard as well. So because profits are, are shared across members, they wanna be really careful about who, who they let in. So they often require a super majority. Um, in the case of a family member joining after the death of someone, they're only allowed one member per family for sure. The other members can then apply to join. And then exiting the cooperative is also hard. So if I'm a part of a cooperative and I wanna leave, this also requires a super majority um, and I lose all value of my membership otherwise. So I lose the value of my land, uh, anything else that's provided like schools or other things like that that are provided by the cooperatives. And so if we think about this from an economics perspective, it's actually interesting design. So there's been some work in economics about potential incentive issues in cooperatives because of this profit sharing. There's been three things. So the first is adverse selection. What that means is that people who are not gonna contribute to the good of the cooperative might join just to benefit from the profit sharing. So it's actually kind of addressed by two and three. It's pretty hard for people to sell or join. There's also this fear of brain drain. What that means is that the most productive members might decide to leave the cooperative because they don't want to share profits. You know, they're, they're producing a lot of the, you know, the total amount in the cooperative, but they have to share some of it. They might be better off producing on their own. That's called brain drain, but that's kind of addressed by point four. Then there's this other thing that's known as moral hazard and effort, which is the focus of the conceptual framework, which is this idea that profit sharing uh, might lead to me working less hard because I know I'll get some profits from you. So how likely is that to apply in this case, especially compared to outside owned uh, haciendas that also suffer from this problem? So to try to structure the interpretation, I provide a principal agent model to structure the analysis. So in the model, again, just cooperatives make decisions via voting. Workers are the ones who decide, and that's really important. In the outside owner system, there's just an owner who makes decisions to maximize their own, which is very different. So the model examines what are the implications of these two types of decision-making rules and things like crop choices, two, two main features. 
So first is owners can't perfectly observe and contract on effort. They can only contract on output. Um, I can't write contracts that say you have to work this hard. I can only be like, I'll pay you if you produce this much coffee. If you produce you know, a little bit more, I'll pay you a little bit more, et cetera. Um, the small assumptions is that workers are heterogeneous. And then crops differ in their contractability, matching focus group evidence. So cooperatives can share profits for cash crops, but not staple crops. In outside ownership systems, what this means is that it's really hard for the owner to um, pay people share cropping contracts for cash for uh, staple crops, but not cash crops. So the model has two main sets of predictions that'll test um, in the subsequent analysis. So interestingly, if you're able to specialize in different types of crops, neither ownership structure necessarily reaches what we think about as the efficient outcome. This happens for different reasons. In haciendas, the, there's this motivation rent extraction trade-off. The owner wants to increase his own profits. Um, to do so, he doesn't pay workers as much as he optimally should, giving them less than ideal incentives. And so he's trying to balance these two forces. I could pay them more, they work harder, but then I get less profits. Therefore, there's this inefficient trade-off that happens there. In cooperatives, it's this, the standard profit sharing problem. If people can vote, then you might have too much profit sharing. Has another, a number of other predictions for crop choices, productivity and equity. So equity, I haven't talked about that and that's what I'll talk about next but it matches some of the other results I've shown you so far. So cooperatives are less likely to specialize in cash crops, uh, but do specialize much more in staple crops and are really productive at them. This is because workers really care about them and they benefit from producing staple crops. Uh, it also predicts that cooperatives will have higher equity. So there'll be less income spread. So let me talk about these two predictions. So first, what are the implications for just aggregate efficiency before going into the implications for equity. So actually I find when I look at um, aggregate profits, very little evidence that they're, that they're starkly different. So looking at figure 16, this is showing you the standard measure for the productivity of a, you know, an agricultural firm, it's just profits per hectare in this case, but any land unit. And here we, we, we see that there aren't huge differences um, in their profits, which is really interesting. There's some differences in their revenues per hectare, but what we really care about is profits. This is because cash crops have very high input costs as well. Uh, so they might give you higher revenues, but they also have higher costs. And that's why we don't see much differences in profits. Um, but these, and these differences are a bit imprecise. But I think this kind of goes against the the stark idea that some economists have, which is that these cooperatives are for sure gonna be much much less efficient. It doesn't seem like there's strong evidence for that, but it's imprecise for sure. And so just to summarize the agricultural results before I turn to worker incomes, I find that cooperatives, if they're able to, they specialize in staple crops over cash crops. These are workers that, these are crops that really benefit workers. They can consume their production and um, workers don't have to share as much of their income for this. And I find inconclusive evidence for aggregate productivity differences. We can think about that as like overall efficiency. And I think the model helps us think that it's probably due to the ability to specialize in different crops. If they just focused in cash crops, it probably wouldn't be the case. If they just focused in staple crops, maybe we'd have a different pattern. But here, because they can allocate work to different tasks, we don't see these differences, which I think is quite interesting. Um, it could apply to a number of other cooperative firms where there's this ability to do different tasks. The paper has a number of robustness checks and extensions that I, I won't really talk about right now, just in the interest of time, but I'm happy to talk about them much more um, in the Q&A. But let me go to the income results. So income and distributions of cooperative workers. So here we're gonna look at how does cooperative ownership affect worker incomes in El Salvador? So to examine this, I use the household survey da data and the survey includes a number of questions on where people live, whether they're a cooperative member or not, and then the number of employees for that property. So I can use these questions to match individuals to cooperatives and haciendas. And I check the matching using um, some household surveys where I actually do have the property and cooperative name where they work. The caveat here is that it's a smaller sample of properties in the census. The census includes you know, 
like 98% of properties in El Salvador, but it doesn't, the household survey doesn't include that. So that's just a caveat, but turn to the results. In column one, I'm showing you differences between cooperative workers and Hacienda workers today on their earnings per capita in the previous month in dollars. So here we're finding that cooperative workers on average seem to have make $50 more per month than Hacienda workers, which is actually a really large amount because in these areas, individuals make about $100 a month uh, in agriculture. These are pretty stark uh, income effects. They're a bit imprecise, but they're pretty large. When we turn to the distribution here, measuring the spread of income. So let's compare all workers in a cooperative and find out how spread out their incomes are. Same thing for Hacienda workers. Um, we find that cooperatives have less spread out income, so more equitable income. So not only do they have higher incomes, they also have more equitable earnings, which is really interesting. Um, this doesn't take into account the earnings of the owner for the haciendas, but it does show you that the workers, so the people actually doing the production, uh, have higher and more equitable earnings. And we can tr try to dig into this a bit more and see who benefits the most from cooperatives. Is it low income workers in particular, or is it like high income workers in particular? And so here we're looking at quantile estimates. What that is, is split all the workers by their income earnings and look at cooperative versus Hacienda workers for low income workers and go off the quantile. Um, and as you can see by this estimate, it's very positive for low quantiles and then zero for high quantiles and perhaps somewhat slightly negative. So what this suggests is that cooperative ownership really benefits the low-income workers the most. This is very consistent with this idea that cooperatives um, share income across workers. So if I'm a low-income worker and I happen to be in a cooperative with a high-income worker, that's really good for me because we're, we're helping each other out, we're sharing earnings, which doesn't happen on haciendas or outside of owned firms. So this suggests that, um, this type of ownership structure is particularly beneficial for low-income workers, like the workers in El Salvador. I think that's very important. So let me just conclude right now. What I do in this paper is I examine the 1980 land reform. I use it as a setting to try to understand what are the empirical differences, um, causal differences between cooperatives and non-cooperatives. And I find three main things. So first is that cooperative ownership induces different patterns of specialization, particularly you specialize in things that workers care more about or benefit the most from. So in this particular setting, what that means is that cooperatives are less likely to specialize in cash crops and more likely to specialize in staple crops where workers um, are the residual claimants. I don't find strong evidence that cooperatives are less productive. So not strong evidence on efficiency, but do find uh, large impacts for equity. So cooperatives tend to have higher and more equitable incomes. And I think these, these results are potentially informative for cooperative policies more broadly. We don't know very much about cooperatives. I think people have very strong uh, gut reactions about cooperatives, but it's very important for policy to the point that the United Nations, for example, deemed 2012 the International Year of Cooperatives for their potential to help low-income workers. Uh, but also did note that there isn't a lot of evidence on this. Uh, so just providing something that helps, helps us understand when are cooperatives good or bad, where their impacts on workers can potentially be informative. Um, so thank you. That's all I have in terms of the main presentation, but I'm really looking forward to any questions and, and comments as well. Thanks. Terrific. Um, do you want to stop sharing screen and then we'll um, kick it off? Professor Yang, do you want to go first? You're muted, Professor Yang. Sorry, Professor Yang, I was trying to call oh, on you. Go ahead. Uh, great paper. Uh, yeah. Right. Um, yeah, so this is, uh, it's striking that there's not a, uh, not an income difference that you're finding. Um, and I guess, you know, I'm interested in what you think about, you know, just the broader impacts on life satisfaction. Um, you know, so if you think about non-pecuniary, um, you yeah. know, being in a cooperative versus uh, being a hacienda worker. Um, certainly, 
I think I would presume that people are happier, <laughs> all things equal. Yeah. Being a cooperative member, you know, uh, part of the decision-making structure of the enterprise versus just being an employee or a tenant farmer. Um, yeah. Curious about your, you know, so I think, you know, if we think about, you know, more broadly, you know, utility as opposed to just income, uh, mm -hmm. I'm curious what your thoughts are on that and whether there's any way you can measure um, you know, sort of more broader life satisfaction, like does the PHPM survey have a question along those lines? Yeah, no, that's an awesome question. No, thank you. Um, so the EHPM doesn't have a very good question on that. They have questions on consumption. And I also find positive effects on consumption, which you would expect just given the income levels. But I can tell you from just um, like focus group evidence, I think you're right. Like I don't speak to this, but speaking to cooperative workers there they there's a lot of pride in owning and making your own decisions which i don't think that's captured in work being an hacienda worker and i think that's critical and that's one thing that interests me interested me a lot originally in, the, in this project was thinking about the differences in how they see themselves um like sense of self and agency just tough to get very good data on that um, i think that's definitely the case you could potentially imagine that very productive hacienda workers are, are happier like if they're if they don't have to share income but you're very productive in an hacienda you might be better off potentially because then i don't have to share income but that doesn't capture um these non-procurinary things that you're talking about the, the ability to make your own decisions to feel part of a community i think that's something that they talk about a lot um that they're in this together that they can help each other out during shocks and that's something i don't look at in this paper too much but it would be very interesting to see like workers in both types of properties where after facing shocks, my sense is that they're so much more resilient in cooperatives because they come and help each other out, um, share income, which you wouldn't also have in an hacienda. And that's hard to value, um, gives you utility if you're risk averse, which we think people are, uh, but that's hard to capture, you know, in, in surveys or something. But it's, yeah, I think there's a lot there uh, that would be super interesting, like these other outcomes. I think that's it, yeah. So if you want to ask questions, um, otherwise just raise your hand and otherwise, um, you know I have questions. So <laughs> um, I thought it was so interesting when you were talking about how people went like overnight, boom, they became landlords. And then when you were spelling out the differences between um, staple crops and cash crops and, and talked about the processing. Now, I don't know what's involved in making coffee yeah. um, or in, in making sugar cane, but my immediate thought was, well, there's probably some equipment that would need to that you would need. And so you didn't go where I thought you were going to go, mm. which is like, oh, well, now you need the capital to be able to buy the equipment to yeah. process these crops. And so, um, I'm curious if you, if capital factors into it or if you looked at that. No, absolutely. Um, I think that's an important part, a potential difference between just broadly cooperatives and outside owners. Like it's hard for workers, especially in the setting to gather capital, you, you would think. Um, I think one thing that, or yes, two things are important in this setting is like you said, the, the reform happened very quickly. So kind of like overnight, which meant that workers weren't, or owners weren't able to like take their processing capacity with them or destroy it, which happened in a lot of other land reforms. Like if the reform was announced, people were like, okay, I'm gonna take the important parts of production. So I meant that most of the, co the cooperatives already had some infrastructure. So they didn't need to raise capital for that infrastructure. Um, historically, like the big infrastructure. Now there could be differences in credit access today, which could drive the effects. Um, the important thing in El Salvador is so in, in, the, in the data, there are no differences in credit access. And the reason is that the cooperatives in El Salvador actually can use their land as collateral as, as like a cooperative as a whole. So I think that's different than some settings where you can't sometimes can't use a firm as collateral. Here, because it's land, they can you know access loans, actually very good loans from banks and stuff um, using their, like pledging their land as collateral. And there are cases where, uh, because prices of agricultural commodities go down, that they've had to default on loans. This also happens in Haciendas, but they do have access to ca uh, credit here through that mechanism, which might not be the case for cooperatives in other settings where you can't you know, pledge land as collateral. I, I think that's an important thing. I do think credit access is huge. If, if you're thinking of like expanding a policy like this to other 
types of industries, workers might not be able to raise credit. Um, they might be constrained and that might be another reason for differences. So I, I think that's a critical question. I think the setting of El Salvador is interesting for that reason and land in particular, but I think you're right. Like that's specific to this setting. Yeah. Interesting. Amy and then Triana. Hi, thanks for a really interesting presentation. Um, oh, I had a question actually very similar with respect to infrastructure. Um, mm. and the reason that I ask is because I was recently in El Salvador and Guatemala also doing interviews and I spoke with a, just a couple of cooperatives and certainly not about these topics. Oh, nice. um, but something that consistently came up is that they often were receiving external assistance for these kind of hard infrastructure uh, inputs. So those processing pieces, uh, farm to market roads, mm. um, and those were allowing them to start to make some of that transition from kind of more stable crops to more cash crops. Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose I was interested if you see that that's kind of, you know, maybe just this kind of random noise, or if you think that there's any sort of role that might be played that cooperatives are going to qualify for, you know, this type of assistance to potentially increase productivity whether it be you know nationally some sort of regional assistance or even kind of international assistance or whether yeah. because cooperatives would qualify Asientes obviously would not um, and I'm interested in whether you see that you know that could potentially play any role in kind of totally um, similar no that's that's a really interesting question um no thank you um I you on about it for a while but it, it is the case that like international organizations are, are quite especially in El Salvador are interested in these cooperatives a lot and they do get access to that so um, in the census data, there's a question on, do you get help from NGOs? And I mean, there's a there's a jump there. So cooperatives are more likely to get help from NGOs today compared to us in this. Um, so yeah, I think that's definitely the case. Um, I'm not sure how, so I, I think one thing I've done is look at the cooperatives that don't get NGO assistance and I find similar patterns there. Um, and that to me suggests that maybe this, these NGOs are helping, but they're not drastically changing their decisions. Um, because you're right, it's a lot of, it's kind of, in some ways I was, I, I thought about it a little bit, like getting credit access, another way to get credit, really cheap credit, you know, because it's like input assistance or things like that. Something that they did talk about a lot, and you know this much more than I do, is they're, they're able to like get access to inputs and things like that, that they need for the further farms. And sometimes through NGO help, but also through banks. But what they complain a lot about is um, like roads and road maintenance. Uh, so things outside of the cooperative, I think they're, they struggle with that. I mean, historically there's reasons for that. So the government that took over and after 1992, 90, after the civil war was very right-wing um, and they were really against these cooperatives. And so they are actually, um, they didn't invest in road maintenance and regions with more cooperative and stuff like that. So I, th I think there are these political forces at play as well. Um, 2013 though, another government, 2012 I think, another government took over uh, that's more amenable to these cooperatives and has helped them out a lot. So they say things have gotten much better, but I think there are these um, ideology forces at play here for sure, for things like world building and things like that. Um, you know, to think about a bit more how to test that, yeah. Oh, it's a really good point. Yeah, really Brianna? Good uh, hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi. Yeah. So I was thinking about the heterogeneity of like geography in El Salvador and how that might affect like the the proportion of lands like below and above the thresholds and mm -hmm. how that might affect like the concentration of uh of haciendas and cooperatives in different areas and whether that yeah. might have had an effect in terms of like maybe if there's a higher proportion of cooperatives in some areas maybe they'll see, like they'll be like increased production or because of like uh like network effects and maybe they're sharing mm. knowledge or whatever or not and whether you saw something like with that or whether you studied it or whether you had enough information to do analyze it yeah no that's a great question i think i mean i do think that there's a lot of these network effects for agricultural production like you really learn from what people around you are doing um I think in El Salvador in general, the coastal areas, I mentioned this really quickly, those are the sugarcane areas because that land is super suitable for sugarcane. There's a lot of cooperatives there, but they choose not to produce as much sugarcane. So so they happen, so just the case of sugarcane specifically, because um, I was there for a bit, is 
you would think that would go against some of the findings. They happen to be in areas with a lot of sugarcane production around these networks of sugarcane producers, but they choose not to produce as much. They definitely produce it, but not as much. So I think that was interesting to me that that kind of suggested it's, at least for sugarcane, it's not as driven by um, by geogra like geographic location, a little bit more by these workers making these decisions, like we'll produce sugarcane, but we also want to produce some other crops for ourselves, which I think is, is kind of what's going on. Um, coffee is a bit trickier because coffee, it really depends on the altitude. So like even in a, re like a small region, like like really tiny region, there's so much variation in coffee production quality because it depends on the altitude, but also the shade and like a number of other factors. Um, I have to think about how to look at that much more, but I, I have tested whether there's differences in like the altitude of these places, so elevation, which is really important for coffee. I don't see differences, but that, again, that's, um, coffee is very tricky. Like it, you know, you, you could have like a property that's at this level, but one that's like that, and that one's better for coffee because of the shade. Like it's, it's really tough. Um, I have to think about that more, but yeah, just for sugarcane, I, I think it would, it goes in the opposite direction of, of what I find. Yeah. That's a really Thank good point. You. I have a question from the chat. Can you say a little bit about how were the original co-op members chosen? And relatedly, yeah. it sounds like they can never leave. Good Lord. Yeah. Um, it, it, yeah, it's not that, that bad. So just on the first question, the original workers um, or the cooperative members originally. So the way they did it is that the government got there or the military got there and then just told workers that were on the property. So these are haciendas that are really big. So workers often reside on the properties. So whoever was residing there that morning, and then they kind of just trusted the people. So they were like, hey, you guys are the workers here right now. Everyone who happened to work on the hacienda before, they're a cooperative member, give me all their names. Um, but they limited the family members. So like, then you might cheat and be like, yeah, yeah, my family also works here. But um, they only allowed one family member at a time. And then they allowed them to have this voting and let people in. So that's kind of how they did it. but. Yeah, actually, the planners talk about how that wasn't perfect necessarily. You could imagine some fraud happening and some people claiming to work on the hacienda that didn't. Um, but in theory, so it was supposed to be the people who worked on the property before, um, which is, is is nice for the empirics because that means that like the workers on these two types of properties are probably similar. It's just some happen to then own it, um, but there might have been a little bit of fraud. I I've looked for those records of what the names of are these people. I haven't been able to find it. Uh, in terms of leaving you can leave but you forfeit a lot so yeah I think you're right like that's that's one thing that I think is in the, the paper I'm not able to study but I think this would be really interesting to study is how it um, might hold back you know migration to the city center if there are opportunities or to the capital because I can leave but I forfeit a lot like I forfeit land I forfeit I mean the community I forfeit the profits that we're sharing there's a lot of things that might tie, I guess some historians have called this that cooperatives tie you to the land. Um, it keeps you in the countryside and that might be bad for the economy moving to something like manufacturing and stuff. So I, I, I'm not able to study that so much here, but um, I think that is definitely an, an important mechanism to, to explore is how it might impede you know, migration to city centers or things like that. Yeah. Well, it sounds like they're making a lot more money too. Yeah. Like yeah, being exactly. a co-op so maybe they don't care like why go to the city if you're making so much more money yeah and I, so something I, I i think is important too is that it's very good for intergenerational mobility so i might if i'm a cooperative member it, it might be hard for me to move to the city because of all these benefits but talking to a lot of cooperative members their their kids were often in the cities because they were able to pay for their school there or for the university degree so they have i have higher income therefore i can pay for better education for my kid Therefore, the next generation might be better off and isn't in the cooperative. So that's a potential benefit. So it might restrict migration for the current generation, but actually help migration, intergenerational migration or mobility for the next generation. So that's also quite important. Okay, Christian, you get the last question, unless it's a short one. And then somebody else gets to chime um, in, no pressure. Cool, I, I hope not. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Montero. Um, I guess my question was, uh, <laughs> uh, my question was uh, with, so one of the transition periods that you were talking about was basically that uh, if a family, a family, if the family, if the person in the cooperative passes away, they elect one of the family members to take their place. Um, has that always been the case? 
And if somebody doesn't, is it been an occasion where they haven't replaced that person with a family member or do they just, and, and if that doesn't happen, do they leave that seat open or do they like, is there a particular way that do they select um, mm. someone to take that particular spot? I don't know. I don't know. I, yeah. I want to hear more about that. That's a great question. Um, and so that varies so much by cooperatives. So, you know, in, in these mm -hmm. settings, it's like you have these formal rules, but people have their own interpretations of them. So there definitely are cases when, um, and I heard about a few examples of this, where someone passes away and their family members actually don't want to join because they're in San Salvador or, mm -hmm. you know, working somewhere else. And that, that happens, like, um, someone passes away and then there's one fewer member. Um, there's no, like, mechanism there, to, like a spot doesn't open up or something. If people want to join, then they can go through the standard process, but there's no exception made there. So there are cases where someone passes away, either they didn't have kids or their kids and, or wife doesn't want, like they don't want to join or husband don't want to join the cooperative. Mm -hmm. That can happen for sure. Mm -hmm. um, the thing that's also, there's a lot of variation is, so say um, someone passes away, some cooperatives are like, no, we're really strict. We only let one person in, the other people have to go through a very formal process. Other people, other cooperatives are like, someone passes away, we kind of let all their kids in pretty easily. You know, like there's not this formality of like, who's the chosen person? You know, we kind of just let everyone in. But the, that depends a lot by um, by cooperative and the rules that they have in place. Um, yeah, some people are like, we don't want to do that because like, what if they let in their laziest kids? You know, like there's a whole, there's a whole like internal dynamics of what the rules should be. But I think there's a lot of areas. I, I think it also actually depends on how tight or close knit the, the cooperative is. Like if the cooperative is small and close knit, they often like, are like, yeah, we let everyone's family member in. But I noticed in the very big ones, um, they were a bit more like, no, 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 we really follow this rule. They have supply, it's very strict. So yeah, that's a good question. Thank you. Great. Well, from here, we are going to wrap up. Um, if we could all uh, take a moment to either push the button or show your video and acknowledge <laughs> Professor Montero. No, thank, thank you, you very so much, much um, for no, coming. And for all the questions, this is awesome. Really good questions. So. Um, I hope you'll come back. We have one more lunch talk of this academic semester. Luke Schaefer will be with us on December 3rd from the Ford School of Public Policy. And he is, of course, um, one of the co-faculty directors of Poverty Solutions. So please come back and thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay.